Hello, I'm Dev Poodle. Today, I'll be teaching you about the marching squares algorithm. Marching squares is a way to generate a 2D approximation of some grid of data. I'll be going over a couple implementations using the Godot game engine. In video games, this algorithm is often used for procedural generation. For example, you could have some noise function over 2D space and then apply marching squares to create a randomly generated world. I'll start off by explaining the algorithm, then I'll show the basics using a tile map layer node. Finally, I'll go over the full algorithm that creates a custom 2D mesh using linear interpolation along the edges to make smoother shapes. So, what problem is the marching squares algorithm trying to solve? It starts with the assumption that we have some sort of function that takes in a 2D point and returns a number. Let's say that this is the input, and up here is the output. As we move the input point around, the outputted value changes. We can visualize this with a gradient, where black represents lower values and white represents higher values. This data could represent a ton of different things. This is an example of a signed distance function, like I showed in one of my previous videos. Instead, it could also be random noise for the purpose of terrain generation. If we wanted a really complicated example, the function could even be something like the density of a fluid simulation. Not going to be rendering that, of course. In all of these cases, we typically choose some threshold value, let's say zero, above which is considered insider shape and below which is considered outside. We can show this shape with a simple shader, alliteration. For the purposes of level generation or in-game interaction with this shape, it'd be really, really nice if we could approximate this using a mesh. That would let us make a bunch of cool rendering effects and allow our shape to interact with the engine's physics system. The easiest form of mesh approximation would be to just use a grid of squares. For each tile, if the center is above a certain value, fill it in with a rectangle. Otherwise, leave it empty. This approximation is very jagged and loses almost all detail. I mean, you're effectively just pixelating the function. You have to have a very small grid before it starts looking at all smooth. Marching squares is essentially just a variation on this technique that makes much better use of each tile. Raising the grid size back up, let's see how it differs. In this approximation, we're testing each cell only at the center, giving us two possible options, either filled in or empty. With marching squares, we instead choose to test each cell at each of its corners. Refilling in each tile, we get this result. I think we can agree this is nicer. It feels more natural at the very least. Since each corner can either be above or below the target value, we have two to the four possible combinations of activated and deactivated corners, which is 16 possible variations for each tile. While on its own, this is quite a visual improvement, there's another step to the marching squares algorithm that makes it look even better, linear interpolation. Let's take a look at this tile. Specifically, let's examine this edge. Remember, the function we based this tile on has an entire range of values it could be. Here's some possible values that the corners could represent. This vertex on our tile ideally should lie exactly where our function crosses the threshold value. We can approximate this by assuming our function linearly goes from the value at the top left corner to the value at the top right corner. If we graph this, we get a line that crosses the threshold value at approximately the 30% mark. So let's shift the vertex to that point. Not too impressive on its own, but going back to a full scene of these tiles, we can apply the same process to the edges of each, and we get this a smoother looking approximation of our function that has the exact same polygon count as the method we were using before. So that's the high level overview of the algorithm complete. Throughout this video, I'll be getting more into the details of it, but let's start out with a really simple implementation in Godot. I'll start out with a tile map that contains the 16 possible tiles packed into a single image and a function that takes in a 2D coordinate and returns noise. Then we loop through all cell coordinates that we want to render and sample a value from our noise at each of the four corners. If this value is above a certain threshold, we say the corner is activated. And if it is below the value, we say it's deactivated. We use the activation values to generate an index into our tile set to get the tile we want to render. Finally, we set the cell of our tile map to that tile. Keep in mind, this is just pseudocode. The actual implementation will be a little more complicated than this. Let's start out with a scene that has a tile map layer child and an empty script. Next, we need to create the tile set that we want to use. In the description, I've included a link to download this image, which contains all the tiles we need. You can either use it or you can choose to make your own. If you do make your own, this is the pattern the tile set has to follow. There are 16 total tiles you need to make, although many of them are just mirrored or rotated copies of other ones, so it shouldn't be too difficult to draw them all. 
Assuming you have your tiles finished, let's go to our tile map layer node. In the tile maps properties, create a new tile set. My tiles are each 64 by 64 pixels, so I have to change this setting. In the bottom panel, under tile set, you can now drag and drop the image containing your tiles. We want it to auto create the tiles. And then let's also click here to add in this top left tile. This is the tile map basically finished. You can now go through and add in collision shapes if you want, but I won't be doing that here. So here's the script. We first want to export a variable called noise that will store a fast noise light. In the nodes inspector, initialize it with Godot's default noise resource. Back in the script, create a function called sample that takes in a 2D vector and returns a float. We're just going to return the noise sampled at the input vector. I'm making this its own function so that it's easier for you to try out different sampling functions later on. Okay, now let's actually place these tiles procedurally. We're going to define a small lookup table of coordinates for the sake of convenience. Here's what the table looks like. As you can see, each element corresponds to a corner of a tile. Oh, and in case you're wondering, the array has to be in this order for some of our later code to work. Next, we can go to the ready function. Let's first get a reference to our tile map layer called tile map. Clear the tile map, just in case there are any stray tiles placed down. We want to loop through all the tiles we plan on creating. First, loop over x coordinates using a for loop, ranging from negative 32 to positive 32. Then, loop over y coordinates in the same way. This will create a 64 by 64 grid of tiles. First, get the center of the tile you want to set by packing the x and y coordinates into a vector 2, adding 0.5 to both, and then multiplying by the size of each of your tiles. In my case, each tile is 64 by 64 pixels. Then define an integer called value that will be set to 0 by default. Iterate through the size of the corners array we defined earlier. To get the corner we're sampling at, take the center of your tile and add in the corresponding element of corners multiplied by half of your tile size, so 32 in my case. Then we'll add to value. Use the sample function we created with the corner as your input. Test to see if it is greater than zero. You could pick some other threshold value, but zero will work for now. This is a boolean, so convert it to an integer. If this greater than expression is true, it will turn into a one, otherwise it will be a zero. Finally, bit shift to this integer by the corner index. If you're already familiar with binary math, you might already know what this line is doing, but I'll still give a short rundown just in case. Think of value like a four digit binary number. This means it has four places that could either be a one or a zero. For each corner, we get a one or a zero depending on if it is greater than or less than our threshold. When we bit shift it, we basically just move the one or zero some amount of digits to the left, and then we add it to value. After our loop is done, this will give us a value where each bit represents whether or not the corresponding corner was active. This is the tile for these specific bits. Finally, after this inner for loop, we can set the tile in our tile map using the set cell function. The coordinate is the x and y values we're looping through, then a zero for the source ID, and finally a vector 2i, with the x coordinate being value mod 4, and the y coordinate being value divided by 4. This will turn our value into a coordinate on our tile set. If you run the project now, you should see something like this. Oh, uh, not that, I mean like this. Depending on the game you're making, this might be enough, but there's still more to the algorithm. So we now need to move on to the mesh implementation of marching squares. Luckily, we'll be able to reuse most of the code we wrote in the tile map implementation. The idea is that instead of representing each tile as a sprite in a tile map, we represent each tile as its own mesh. Then we combine all of it into a long list of geometry to be rendered with a mesh instance 2D. First, we need a lookup table for all the geometry we're going to be using. Now, making this list is quite annoying, so I've included a link to this script in the description. It contains arrays for the vertices and indices of all required tiles, and you can access it using the base mesh's class name. So I'd recommend copy and pasting this into your project, and then restarting the engine to make sure it all loads in correctly. With the lookup table defined, we can get into generating the mesh. I'm actually going to start out with an exact copy of the scene we were already working on, but I'll delete the tile map layer. 
Instead, we're going to be using a mesh instance 2D, and that's all the setup we need to do in the scene. Back to the script, we'll first replace this tile map variable with a mesh variable, which will be a new array mesh. Then we'll set the mesh of our mesh instance 2D to this variable. If you've seen some of my other videos, like the one on mesh generation or planet generation, then some of this next stuff might be familiar. Create a new array called surface array. Resize it to mesh.arraymax. First, we'll create the vertex array by indexing into surface array at mesh.arrayvertex and setting it to a new packed vector2 array. Then we'll create the index array by indexing at mesh.arrayindex and setting it to a new packed int32 array. After the for loop where we create all the tiles, call mesh.addSurfaceFromArrays to add the geometry in our surface array to our mesh. The geometry will consist of triangles and pass in the surface array. All right, now all that's left, and I guess this is actually quite a lot, but all that's left is replacing this one line where we set the tile in our tile map. Instead, I'm going to call a new function add tile, which will take in our surface array, the center of our tile, and the variable value, which if you remember is basically an index corresponding to the specific type of tile we want to add. Now we have to define this function. So add tile, taking in a surface array, center, and tile index. First, we'll create a vertices array that takes the vertex array stored in base meshes at the tile index and duplicates it. Then we do the same thing to create an indices array. Later on, it will be useful to know the total amount of vertices currently stored in the surface array, so we'll store that in a variable called total vertices. Okay, now we want to iterate through the size of our vertex array. First, we'll grab the vertex at i, then we'll multiply it by half of our tile size and offset it by center. This moves it to the correct position in world space. Finally, we put it back into the vertex array. We're going to do something very similar for the index array, so just copy and paste the for loop, replace vertices with indices, and then we can just remove all of this and put in a single line, indices i plus equals total vertices. This will make sure the indices are offset properly. At the end of our function, we then append our vertex array to the surface array vertices. And append our index array to the surface array indices. Running our project, we get this. It currently looks practically identical to the tile map solution, but using an exact mesh instead of just sprites. We can now get to the final step of the marching squares algorithm which is linear interpolation. Let's look at the diagram we were using before when I first went over the concept. The idea was that the middle vertices of any given tile shouldn't actually lie straight at the center. It should be placed wherever our function crosses the threshold value. We can approximate each edge as linearly transitioning from the value of one corner to the other. Keep in mind that we only have vertices at the middle of edges when one corner is below the threshold and the opposite corner is above it. This means that when we graph it, we're guaranteed to get a line that crosses through the threshold value, which is zero in this case. The position of this intercept is where our vertex is supposed to be. With a little math, it shouldn't be too difficult to find. Let's get this into code. Back in the vertex for loop, we'll define two new variables. First is edge, which is true when the absolute value of the x component plus the absolute value of the y component equals zero. This tells us whether the vertex we're looking at is an edge vertex or a corner vertex. Second, direction, which tells us which way the edge that the vertex is on points. It will be vector2.up if vertex.x doesn't equal zero, else it will be vector2.right. Now, after we translate the vertex into world space, we test to see if the vertex is an edge vertex. Then we get the corners next to the vector. Corner one is the vertex plus the direction times half the tile size. Corner 2 is the same thing, but swap the sign of direction. Store the values of these corners into new variables, 
value 1 and value 2, which are gotten by sampling the noise at the corners. We can now get a weight variable by taking the sum of the values and dividing by the difference of the values. This will get us a weight ranging from negative 1 to positive 1 depending on which corner it's closest to. And then we can get it ranging from 0 to 1 by dividing by 2 and adding 0 0.5. Finally, set vertex equal to corner 1, lerp corner 2, using weight. If you save and run the project now, you should see this. Our harsh 45 degree transitions have been turned into much smoother shapes. Here's some other before and afters with different sampling functions. As you can see, it makes quite a massive difference in some cases. So that's Marching Square's algorithm in Godot. I'm DevPoodle, thank you so much for watching, and wait, am I hearing something or...